In this episode of Falmouth in Focus, we'll learn about the largest grassroots network dedicated to fighting Parkinson's disease, hear how the 6th annual Ruck for Hit event will have a hybrid look this year, and check in on the fall two seasons of Clipper football and volleyball. All that and more, coming up on this edition of Falmouth in Focus. Hello and welcome to Falmouth in Focus, FCTV's current affairs program. I'm your host, Michael Kasparian. The supply of vaccine doses has been steadily increasing on Cape Cod during the past few weeks as more residents are becoming eligible to receive it. Falmouth's health agent, Scott McGann, encourages residents to refer to the Falmouth website at falmouthma.gov for links to the latest vaccine information. You can view his Friday video briefings on FCTV Government Channel 15, our Facebook page, and fctv.org. April is Parkinson's Disease Awareness Month, and in Massachusetts alone, more than 17,000 people over the age of 60 are diagnosed and living with PD, and many of those individuals reside on Cape Cod. The American Parkinson's Disease Association, or APDA, is the largest grassroots network dedicated to fighting this disease. Hi, my name is Bill Pache, and I'm the executive director of the American Parkinson's Disease Association, Massachusetts chapter. We cover the Northeast, and we're really excited to be here with Falmouth Community TV. What we do as an organization is we provide programs and services and support for those individuals suffering with Parkinson's disease. April is Parkinson Disease Awareness Month. Here in Massachusetts, we have a wide range of different activities that we're implementing. And so our goal for the month of April is to make sure that we're raising awareness of Parkinson's disease and making sure that people know about all the great programs and services that we provide. And so here in Massachusetts, we have a volunteer board in Massachusetts and also a Parkinson Support Network volunteer board on Cape Cod. Uh, we have a wide range of exercise support groups, programs, and partners, uh, those which include Spalding Rehabilitation on Cape Cod, as well as uh, Pavilion on Cape Cod. We have a walk, Optimism Walk, scheduled on May 22nd, and you can find information by going to the APDA website here in Massachusetts. We're fortunate to have great volunteers on our APDA and PSN board one of which is uh, Jay Zavala, who lives on Cape Cod. And the great part about having Jay on the board is he knows the Cape Cod landscape, has participated in many of our programs, and is very passionate about uh, the Parkinson's community. And so I'd like to turn it over to Jay Zavala. Thanks, Bill. It's a pleasure to be with you on FCTV. You know, of course, I'm a member. Uh, Bill, with April being Parkinson's Awareness Month, I know that here on the Cape, we have a lot of activities going on. Uh, for example, you mentioned Spalding's program of physical fitness. That's Rocksteady Boxing. I'm a participant in that. We have a lot of great activities uh, in our communities across the 15 towns on Cape Cod. And one that's really important to me is the support groups that we have that are there not only for the park, my fellow parkies, but also for our care partners to help them with the struggles that, that we face as we move along and try to defeat this, this illness. Um, we, the, the May 22nd Optimism Walk is really a great opportunity to get familiar with what we're doing and how well we are organized. I think we've got about a thousand folks or so that are estimated to be have Parkinson's on Cape Cod. And of course we have an older uh, community. I believe 25% of our community is at least 65 years of age or older. So you find a lot of programs on Cape Cod geared to our interests. Tai Chi is one of those, Rocksteady Boxing. I already mentioned Speed uh, Bicycling is also on our radar. I, I talked about our, our great dance and uh, choral groups. 
that help work with folks who are having issues with their voice and uh, balance. So we have a lot of great activities on Cape Cod for, for our parky friends and beyond. I think one of the really important things uh, from an organizational, organizational standpoint is to be engaged with the community and getting information from the community and those individuals with Parkinson's disease as to what their needs are and what their desires are is incredibly important. And what we've been able to do in the community is really engage those wonderful individuals with Parkinson's disease to help us navigate through this challenging time uh, during the pandemic. And we very much appreciate that. For more information about APDA programs, services, and support, visit their website at apdaparkinson.org. Thanks to Andrew Richards for that segment. It's time now for three things from Town Hall, FCTV's condensed version of the takeaways from recent municipal meetings. Selections are chosen based on community impact. In its last meeting, the Select Board discussed the warrant articles on the upcoming Spring Town Meeting. With so many discussion-worthy articles, the Board found it may be better to hold off many articles, including petitioner articles, until June, so they may have an in-person debate on the many contentious issues. Jones, excuse me, I'm sorry, Doug Jones. Uh, I'm suggesting Articles 2, Articles 17 through 34, in articles 38 to 40, we are committed to putting on the special town meeting for July, for June. I, you missed 35 and 36, right? I thought I said articles, sorry, I meant to say down to article 36. 17 through 30, 36, yep. and then 38 30, 38 through 40. Yep. Right. right. The board also voted to add two alternative members to the beach committee to reduce the amount of work the current members are doing. The two additional members increases the board's members from five to seven. The town charter defines the beach committee as having five members, but that may change after a May vote on the ballot that changes that definition. So, um, if just to remind folks, this was a discussion we had at our last meeting about putting temporary, uh, excuse me, some alternate members on the beach committee um, to help kind of lighten the load. There's significant work to be done on that committee. And, um, and they requested that we add some additional members because of a charter review vote that still needs to, uh, you know, charter um, uh, amendment to our charter that still needs to be voted in. It's not really appropriate for us to actually add additional members but there's nothing that prevents us from adding some alternate members. And again, those, those folks could um, assist with the tasks that the Beach Committee has. So that's what we're here to do tonight. And we had talked about um, adding two additional positions. The board finally discussed town manager Julian Suso's employment agreement, which was extended by three years. The new agreement begins in November, which no longer contains a cost of living adjustment, but rather institutes a pay increase based on specific goals set out by the select board. A subcommittee is to be established to set Mr. Suso's goals and to adjust them accordingly as the agreement period moves forward. The ultimate product was a draft that this board received and took a look at this evening. And um, I will just point out... Um, uh, or Na Nancy or Doug, do you want to point out the highlights? I can do that, whatever you'd like to do. Doug, do you want to point out what you did earlier? Um, sure. So it's a three-year contract that will be starting in November of 2021. Uh, some of the things that are changes is uh, there was a in the past a COLA for the contract that was tied into the COLA for other municipal employees. Uh, we have removed that from this contract and instead are putting in uh, some specific goals and uh, any increases in the next three years will be um, decision based on the by the board uh, following up upon completion of goals that are being set put forward uh, we are increasing the car allowance from 500 to 600 dollars and we are a month uh, a month um, <laughs> we are increasing the deferred compensation of the pension from five percent to six percent and increasing the uh, a, adding in a 
life insurance policy at the rate of $2,000 for in total increases of about uh, four to $5,000 uh, for this upcoming contract. To see the meetings in their entirety, check out Government Channel 15's program schedule at fctv.org. It's now time for our calendar segment. On April 7th at 7 p.m., the West Falmouth Library celebrates National Poetry Month by hosting local poet Mary Swope on Zoom as she reads from her collection, Phosphorescence. To register for this free presentation, email the library at westfalmouthlibrary at gmail.com. The Falmouth Garden Club will hold an informational meeting on April 12th at 10 a.m. for anyone interested in finding out about the club's activities and opportunities to collaborate with fellow gardeners. Active club members will be available for this Zoom event to answer any questions about the benefits of Garden Club membership. Visit www.falmouthgardenclub.org to register. Here at FCTV, we're again offering our popular Vacation Animation Camp for children aged 7 to 12. This in-person program will be offered over a four-day period during the spring break from school, Tuesday through Friday, April 20 to 23. There will be two sessions offered each day, a morning session from 10 a.m. to noon and an afternoon session from 1 to 3 p.m. Each session will have an eight student limit and COVID-19 protocols, including social distancing and mask wearing, will be followed and required of all participants. For more information, check out the FCTV website at fctv.org. And finally, don't forget to join us on April 22nd at 7 p.m. for our next virtual installment of our open mic series, Poetic License. Sign up for another night of poetry and prose, stories and songs, with entertainment provided by you and your friends and neighbors. April's suggested theme is Hope Springs Eternal. Pre-register by Wednesday, April 21st to receive your Zoom login information. Check out fctv.org for more information. We're going to take a quick break, and when we return, we'll hear about the annual Ruck for Hit Challenge Weekend coming later this month. Stay with us. Hello, I'm Victoria Santos, a Falmouth Theatre Guild board member. As a local nonprofit, we're committed to presenting outstanding, award-winning theatrical productions, engaging community partnership, partnering with local schools, businesses, and community groups to engage in and promote the cultural growth of the Falmouth community and vicinity by advancing interest, skills, and appreciation of the theatrical arts. Amid the COVID-19 pandemic, we were forced to cancel our spring production of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And due to the uncertainty of reopening large capacity performance venues, We've also been forced to cancel our entire current season through May, 2021. The loss of ticket sales has greatly impacted our small nonprofit theater. As an all volunteer group, we need your support now more than ever. Visit our website to find out how you can help support Falmouth Theater Guild at falmouththeaterguild.org. Become a member and join us as we hope to begin producing shows again in the fall of 2021 in a way that provides a safe environment for audiences, casts, and crews, and volunteer staff. Our lights are dark now, but we will shine again soon. Welcome back. Heroes in Transition is holding their sixth annual Ruck for Hit Challenge Weekend later this month, and we spoke with Executive Director Nicole Spencer about the plans for this hybrid event. The support that we received last year for the Challenge Weekend was really wonderful. Um, we added rucking, hiking, running, biking, swimming, paddling, anything you can do to um, bring miles to your team. And that really was a huge benefit for us for the weekend that we had in September. So when we started talking about what we were gonna do for this year, 
not really being sure if we were going to be able to have the full event where um, we weren't really sure where the state of um, anything was going to be. So we decided to do the challenge weekend again. And um, we've gotten so much response. Um, we have 19 teams signed up right now. Um, many different individuals that are interested in um, helping us raise awareness and funds for the organization and it's I think um, really turning out to be a wonderful event. You know through these tough times the support of the community has been so important to us and going forward with especially with the challenge event coming up on the 30th of April through May 2nd we're just seeing the outpouring of support um, we have a, you know, teams that are doing really outside the box ideas to try and get their miles and really to help us raise awareness and funds. Um, and we, we can't do our work without that support. So we're grateful for that. This year's challenge weekend is April 30th through May 2nd. To learn more, visit heroesintransition.org. Thanks to Alan Russell for that story. The Cahoon Museum of American Art recently opened its doors for the season with a new exhibit featuring the works of Scott Pryor. We spoke with director and curator Sarah Johnson to learn more about the exhibit. We um, have a current exhibit on view called Scott Pryor Eliminations and Scott Pryor is a, a renowned a contemporary realist painter in New England and this is his first solo exhibition uh, on Cape Cod. Um, Scott had, has a long connection to Cape Cod. Uh, he started his career in Provincetown and uh, he paints many of the scenes, as you can see behind me, um, of the Cape. So um, this painting is called The Yellow Chair and it's a typical realistic painting by Scott Pryor. It features his backyard on Cape Cod and it's so realistically detailed that you could imagine yourself walking right into the painting and um, experiencing this backyard. It also has a beautiful um, sense of depth at the top. You could even you know, follow the eye um, further out into the landscape. Um, one unique thing about Scott's paintings is that every inch of detail is in focus in the painting, so you really get this vivid sense of experience. So I hope that the community will come out and see the Scott Pryor exhibition. Um, it's a really special treat for us to have this kind of solo show of his work on view on Cape Cod. We borrowed um, some really fine examples from other museums, including the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the New Britain Museum of American Art, and the de Cordova Museum, as well as borrowing from a number of private collections. So the exhibition covers 10 decades of Scott Pryor's career and includes new works, um, including paintings of Cape Cod. So it's a really special exhibition, and I hope that people will uh, take the time to come out and, and see it. To visit the Cahoon Museum, check out registration information on their website, cahoonmuseum.org. Thanks to Alan Russell for that story. We're going to take a quick break, and when we return, we'll check out some Falmouth High School sports. Stay with us. Hi, I'm Mark Pearson, Executive and Artistic Director of the College Light Opera Company at the Highfield Theatre in Falmouth. And I'm Joan McDonald, General Manager of Clock. In addition to being the best summer theatre on the Upper Cape, Clock is an integral part of our local and national arts landscape. We provide a unique opportunity for college-aged theatre artists and administrators to practice their craft in a supportive and professional environment. Through a highly competitive audition process, we select 75 of our nation's most promising young artists to be in residence in Falmouth for 11 intense weeks of production. The result is nine fully produced operettas and musicals. These are considered nine of the best productions on Cape Cod each year. Ticket sales account for only 60% of our annual operating budget. We are deeply indebted to our loyal supporters who generously make up the difference. As we look forward to resuming normal operations, we're excited by the many plans and opportunities for community outreach and education. This will be made possible through the completion in June of our new year-round rehearsal and office building. You can learn more about CLOCK and our mission at collegelightoperacompany.com.
Welcome back. Falmouth High School began its Fall 2 opening season this week, starting an abridged football and volleyball season with new COVID protocols in place. Let's go to the FHS Fieldhouse and Multipurpose Field for more on that. FHS Varsity Football took on the DY Dolphins on March 20th for their season opener. After trading possession for most of the first, Dougie Rose, in his first ever varsity start, had the quarterback keep and brought the ball within the 10-yard line. The Clippers were able to capitalize on that play right after to make it 7-0 in the first. Then as Yarmouth quarterback Henry Mashnick rallied the Dolphins to make it 7-6 from a 35-yard completion, which is how the teams went into the half. Early in the third, Rose managed to find the gap and went on a 70-yard sprint down the field to make it a 14-6 Falmouth lead. Just two minutes later, Julian Hendricks, with a perfect read on the pass, managed to snag the ball, find a lane, and bring the ball down 45 more yards to make the game 21-6. D.Y. at that point found their momentum after that play, scoring three more touchdowns after FHS ran in one of their own to tie the game up at 28. Now late in the fourth, FHS tried to seal the win with a field goal, but the game went into overtime. The Dolphins elected to return first and held the Clippers to a nail-biting 35-28 loss in the first of their abridged season. Turning things over to varsity volleyball, the Clippers kept up pressure against arch-rival Barnstable High School, through the first and second sets, FHS was able to capitalize on several key rallies, but unfortunately wasn't able to keep pace. The Velmouth High School team reached a milestone in the third set of their loss, taking their first set in school history against Barnstable, according to Falmouth head coach Ernie Holcomb. Jay McLeod had 11 kills and 6 blocks on the night, Camille Leet had 20 assists, and Paige Farrington had 4 kills and 3 blocks for Falmouth as varsity volleyball fell to Barnstable 3-1 on the final. Thanks to Ryan Weber for that piece. Herring will soon be migrating into Falmouth streams, so Ryan Collins from My Fishing Cape Cod gives us an underwater look. In this video, we take an underwater look at Cape Cod's River Herring. This footage was filmed on April 9th, 2020, at a herring run on Upper Cape Cod. Each spring, these herring migrate from the open ocean into Cape Cod's streams and rivers. For centuries on Cape Cod, river herring were harvested for many different reasons. However, today, they are a protected species. If you look closely at the herring in the center of your screen, you'll notice what might be claw marks on its back. More than likely, this herring narrowly escaped being caught by an osprey or a hawk. River herring encounter many obstacles throughout their migration. Herring also have to swim against a very strong current in order to reach their freshwater spawning grounds. Thanks to Ryan Collins from My Fishing Cape Cod for that segment. SCTV wants to remind you that television can be as easy as hitting record on your smartphone. We'd like to invite all Falmouth residents and visitors to share their slice of life with us. Email us your photos and videos, or upload them to Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram using the hashtag MyFalmouth or Falmouth in Focus to be featured on the show. Thank you to our most recent contributors. We leave you now with the sights and sounds from Falmouth's elementary schools. 
Thank you for watching Falmouth in Focus. We'll see you next time.